us a sense of how you became intrigued with this topic. Uh, First of all, let me just also say thanks to all of you for coming tonight so close to the holiday season. It's, uh, I'm really overwhelmed and thrilled to see all of you here, so thank you. And thank you to Barbara sure. for this. Uh, I got interested, yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you, uh, I got interested in forgiveness because I needed a thesis topic for my master's degree uh, about 18 years ago, and it was something my advisor was working on. And uh, it, as I got deeper and deeper into it, as these things often uh, happen, I found myself really immersed in the details of research. And I guess about five or six years ago, um, came up for a bit of air and wondered about the big picture of forgiveness. You know, it, it, things stopped making sense, I think. In the same way you look at a word, you know, if you look at the word talk, you know, and you look at the word talk for, you know, a minute and a half. It doesn't look like anything anymore. And I guess the details of research on forgiveness kind of started to look that way to me. What is this all about? Why do we do this? Why do people even have the ability to do it? Mm. You know, we don't have the, I would love to have x-ray vision, right? It would be great. I, I know it would give me deep pleasure to have the, have the ability of x-ray vision. I would get a lot of, of, you know, a lot of satisfaction from that, but I don't. I do have the ability to forgive, and I, I guess I just wanted to understand that in a deeper way than, than I was able to uh, at, at the time. And okay, so before forgiveness is revenge. Let's yeah. start with re yeah. revenge, if we could. You propose that, uh, re that revenge is not a sickness, it's not a disease, but it's part of our kind of neural wiring, our evolution. Um, in other words, that when the Hatfields and the McCoys feud for you know, year after year, decade after decade, when someone goes postal, um, that is an utterly human phenomenon. Why do you say that? And, and give us some of your evidence. Yeah, this is an interesting, to me, to me this is one of the interesting assumptions that I, I faced in my first decade of research on forgiveness. If, if you look throughout world history, you do get this idea that what we're supposed to do when we think about the desire for revenge is to think about it as some curse, you know. It's some curse that humanity has to live with, right? It's some, um, it's, it's a, a moral defect. Or re re revenge is a, a sickness, some failing in, in human nature. And that seemed wrong to me, again, as I, when I sat back and contemplated things, because you, you, you don't find a lot of traits that are species typical, that are characteristic of a species across, across history and across humanity, that can exist the way they do in that form um, if, if they are reflective of something just gone terribly wrong. Instead, I wanted to turn it on its head and say, is there something right about revenge? Can we, and to do that, I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe there, we can find if we look at what revenge does for people, not, not the fingerprint of illness or moral depravity, but the fingerprint of function, um, evidence that humans were in fact uh, designed by the simple forces of natural selection to have a taste for revenge when so, harmed. So in other words, they, uh, revenge solved a problem. Revenge solved some problems, yeah. What kind of problems? Uh, there are three things that revenge is really good at. And, and what I, what I tried to do in understanding these things was to scour research, not just for my own field of psychology, but how anthropologists think about these things and how behavioral econo uh, economists are thinking about them these days. Um, and what you find is three things that it's, that it's great at. One is, it, and probably the, most, the thing most people can relate to, is it, it deters people from harming you a second time, right? Mm -hmm. So if, right. if, if you... Um, if you are willing to impose a cost on somebody who's harmed you, what that basically does is that it serves as a lesson that if they repeat the behavior in the future, they can expect that you're going to, ta you're going to uh, tax them in the same way with this retaliatory cost. So, um, so if they take, if, 
if one caveman takes another caveman's you know lion away uh, or you know the food away yeah. they, you, you come back at them so they won't do that again exactly and you see this and this is pervasive across many group living animals you don't have to just look at human beings but to see hmm. punishment serving this really important function you can look at in uh, all across the primate order I mean there's many different pr kinds of primates that, non-human primates, that show this similar tendency to use punishment to deter individuals from, from harming them a second time. Hmm. Any specifics? I mean, oh, my, my, favorite, my favorite are these uh, monkeys called Japanese macaques. So they're very status conscious, right? They, they're very intimidated by hierarchy. You know, the, 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 the big guy, the big alpha in, in in the, the, the group they live in is, is very intimidating to them. So, um, but there's lots of conflict, you know, squabbles and fights and all these things. Um, and um, in fact, in, in my limited experience, these, are, these can be some nasty animals. They seem to like nothing more than throwing poo at, at onlookers. I mean, that's, that's, that seems to be what they, you know, their, their favorite hobby. But, but they, you know, they, they, they have a tendency to get in lots of petty squabbles. But if a high-ranking individual decides to harm a lower ranking individual. It's really hard for this low ranking individual to turn around and retaliate directly against this alpha male. So what he does instead is he will go find this guy's nephew and harm the nephew. And he, about 90% of the time, he will harm that nephew while the alpha male is, is watching. And really what, what, I, what I think he's doing is, is, is he's saying, you know, you can harm me because you're, you've got a lot more power than I do, but I can, still, I can still inflict a cost on you through your genetic relatives. So it's a way of teaching a lesson that um, if you harm me, I have a way of getting back at you even if I can't harm you directly. And her, harm not only the person uh, or the, the animal directly, but also you, you, you kind of make a statement for others watching. Is that right? So. Yeah, and that's a second thing that revenge is great at, is it really, if you can establish a, a, a reputation for yourself as the kind of person who does get payback, um, it, it serves as a kind of an insurance policy, right? You can form this reputation as someone who does return an eye for an eye, and then everyone else in your living group realizes that you, 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 you're that type of person, you have that kind of temperament, and that you're a hothead. And that will, that will, essentially what that does is that that will encourage onlookers from, from, from harming you in the first place. So it has this sort of deterrent function, even among people who haven't even harmed you yet. And, and you, there's a third thing. I think there's a guppy story, right? Well, yeah, the, 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 the third thing that, and this is, this is the real, this is an eye-opener for me, is that it seems that without the ability to retaliate, human beings couldn't have develop the high levels of cooperation that we, that we engage in as a species. Um, I mean, if you think about humans, one, one of the things that makes us really special, it's not, it doesn't make us unique, but it makes us really special, is our ability to cooperate intensely with individuals that aren't our genetic relatives. I mean, there, there are, there's lots of cooperation in the animal kingdom, but our ability to cooperate with each other, even when we don't have genetic interests in each other, um, is, is pretty unusual uh, across the animal kingdom. And so how does revenge provoke cooperation? Yeah, this is, this is, this is fascinating. If you, th if you think about the institutions we use to make, to enforce cooperation today, we've got things like prisons, right? We have things like contracts that can be enforced in courts, and we have, we have, um, we have uh, uh, court systems we can use, and all sorts of these institutions we can use to get people to cooperate with each other, even though there might be in some incentive for them to cheat, to cheat each other, right? Um, uh, I mean, in, in light of uh, this Madoff business over the couple of days, I'm sure this is you know, awfully salient here in New York City. But if you imagine a time when we didn't have these kinds of institutions that can enforce cooperative norms, how did people do it, right? One of the ways that we did it prior to social institutions seems to be the use of punishment against people in our groups that would be selfish. Because if you think about, if you think about kind of the, the dilemma of cooperation, right? Um, if we have a group of four people and we can all work on a, on a project together, 
we all have to, if we all make sacrifices, right, we all invest some of our time or some of our resources or some of our effort, we can get the job done. But the smartest thing to do would be to be the one guy or gal who doesn't contribute to the, to the development of that good, but still takes advantage of it. You right? get all the benefits and none of the costs. Right, the free right. ride.